to everybody. I'm uh, Cristiano, uh, the lead AI scientist here at Pi School. Uh, this is our sixth uh, um, and last tech talk for this uh, session, session 12. And today uh, we welcome Ahmed from uh, Explain. Uh, Ahmed is an electrical engineer and data scientist. Uh, he is now pursuing research in several fields of machine learning. And today, especially uh, today, Ahmed, uh, after a uh, an introduction on generative and flow-based models um, will explain us uh, some technical details on uh, diffusion models that uh, you see quite recently become very very popular so i don't want to spoil uh, uh, much more and welcome again to hamed and from now on i will give you the floor so thank you uh -huh. Thank you very much, Cristiano. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is Ahmed speaking. So, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have prepared a slide, and uh, actually, I'm using a notebook from Hugging Face during the session. So, uh, I'm sharing on the sharing that on the uh, message section, so that you can also follow up with the call up when I'm when I came into uh, that part. So, I will start with uh, sharing my screen. Please uh, let me know if you are able to see my slides. Hello? Yes. OK. So uh, hello, everyone, again. Uh, so today, I will uh, talk about the generative models. I do a, a small introduction. And then I will go into the diffusion models that I am sure that most of you heard uh, recently. Uh, they have become very famous very fast and every day there is a research coming up so uh, i'm sure that maybe one week uh, from this from today uh, you will be already outdated uh, but today i am aiming to actually give you the foundation of a diffusion based uh, generative model so that you can uh, at least understand follow up with the researchers and see okay this is the difference between that and uh, I suspect that most of you came across some artistic images that are generated by AI models in the internet and maybe in the Twitter and social media. And uh, name, if we give some names, so maybe stable diffusion or open AI is the DALI 2. They are the most recent ones uh, that are very famous uh, to generate high quality images. And uh, today I will start with a general introduction and then continue with the diffusion models. And uh, at the end of the talk, I expect you to understand the basic concept of the diffusion models, especially. Uh, and if you have any questions during the presentation, please uh, don't hesitate to interrupt. Uh, but I will try to keep 15 minutes at the end of the uh, this session so that I get the questions and we have like a, a conversation on it. So let's start. Uh, so this is the content of today's talk. Uh, I will give a general uh, overview of the gener generative models. Uh, this is important so that you uh, will be able to compare uh, the different models and different approach. And we understand what diffusion models are actually doing better than the others. Uh, and then we will play around some uh, stable diffusion uh, outputs uh, uh, from some resources. There are actually many resources in the internet if you search for it. And uh, stable diffusion, uh, it's a model uh, that is uh, recently published. And it is published by uh, Stable AI uh, and together with some researchers from LMU. Uh, and I'm from LMU as well, so I have a master's degree there. And it's an honor to actually have my colleagues there uh, having such an important uh, contribution to the research. Uh, in this, we will actually first play around with some collab notebook from Hugging Face uh, folks so that we can understand what this uh, stable diffusion is capable of. And then we will go into uh, a little bit uh, detail of the diffusion, uh, not too much into the math part, but uh, on the basic concept and the foundation of that, so that you understand the general idea uh, of the diffusion process. So uh, there are three most common generative models uh, other than the diffusion. Uh, the first one would be like autoencoders and the variational autoencoder is the most uh, famous one among those. 
then we have like a generative adversarial networks. They uh, usually meant, mentioned as GANs. And we have also flow-based models. Uh, they all have some uh, advantages, but uh, also disadvantages uh, for each other. So for example, uh, for variational time encoder, you are actually uh, uh, training two models at the same time and trying to decrease a surrogate loss, like it's a fake loss, uh, so that you find the original image, uh, like generate an image. Uh, so let me give small uh, introduction for each of those. Uh, I spent one slide for each of them. So this is how variational autoencoder looks like. Uh, the X is the image, input image, and the X uh, dot, X hat is actually the predicted image, and you expect this model to have ideally X is equal to X hat. And what you do, you first have an encoder architecture. You have a, like a much smaller size uh, latent variable. This is called Z, and it's like a uh, it's always mentioned as the Z in all of the papers, so that's the notation. If you see any Z in or any of the figures, just uh, assume that that's the latent. And latent means uh, it's a, like smaller version of the data, but uh, uh, it tries to capture all the information that you have. So it's like zipping the data. So this is the input image. We uh, convert it to the latent space, and then we try to reconstruct this. So whenever we actually play around with this latent space, then we are able to generate an image. So this is the training time, but in the inference time, you will only have the decoder use. And this latent space is kind of expressing that image, like the image space in uh, universe. And you, whenever you select a dot in that universe, it will correspond to an image and the decoder will be able to generate that one. But this, this advantage of the variation autoencoder is that it uh, relies on a surrogate loss. It's like a lower bound to, uh, uh, of the log likelihood, and you try to maximize that. So it's not directly uh, maximizing a, a log likelihood. Uh, that's uh, one of the problem of the variation of the and it also needs to train two networks at the same time. This is uh, a hard task actually to do. Uh, so that are the disadvantages of uh, that. And for generative adversarial networks, uh, it is a similar, but here we have like adversarial training. So we have a discriminator. We have uh, a noise coming uh, coming for the generator, and then we also introduce the, that noise to the discriminator. If this discriminator, like randomly introduce the discriminator, and the discriminator will determine if that's a real image or a fake image. And the discriminator and generator will kind of fight with each other. Generator will try to generate a real image, like real like image, so that the discriminator ideally will have 15% uh, accuracy. So it's just a binary classification, but the problem with this is you are again training two networks and they like none of them should go uh, better than the other like they always should train at the same same level so that you are able to get a better better high quality images if the discriminator is performing really good and generator is not then uh, you will basically fail in the training and this is actually uh, causing some unstable trainings and it is not ideally to apply to different use cases that you might have in your mind. Uh, they are really good at creating uh, high resolution images, but they are limited because of this unstable training. Uh, so these are all trees, and oh, sorry, or two, and we have also flow-based models. So in the flow-based models, uh, imagine we always try to find the latent space, and from this latent space, we want to generate an image. But uh, how you will be able to, for example, uh, uh, like divert your personal image, or maybe you have like a really good, uh, uh, like really good product and you want to actually make this more artistic. So you have to go from the real image to the latent space first, and then try to use your inverse model to create like a more artistic image. So you always try to go from the real to the latent, but this is not easy for uh, any of the architecture that we mentioned. And flow-based model try to, come up with this by using revertible functions. So here we have a like, for example, we have a convolutional neural network that is uh, just uh, encoding the image, but they such a like, uh, how to say, they uh, converted all this convolution operation and other operations that you might think of in a way that they will be inversible and you will just take the inverse of the function so that you can come up uh, with the real image from the latent directly. So 
it's like the decoder and encoder, but in a other way uh, around. So you don't actually train an inverse. You just train the flow model. And then inverse will be just the uh, analytically inverse of the these functions. And you are limited to, limited to use transformable functions in your architecture. So this is limiting you. So uh, that's also not a good thing uh, to have uh, to be able to actually really have uh, different scenarios. So you will always be limited with the complexity of your model. So that's why we have a fourth model. So this fourth model is, fourth model is the diffusion models. They uh, try to add noise like iteratively to your real image uh, to go to the uh, to go to a pure noise. So what you do, for example, here is a input image that you have, and you gradually add noise to it. This number of steps can change. Imagine we have like 50 steps, and at the end, you add too much noise, and you will have a, like basically a, just a noise, a pure noise uh, image. And the good thing about this diffusion models is that you never uh, decrease the size of your latent variable. The, the latent variable size is equal to the input image. There are some other ways to do, uh, like not maybe decreasing that size, but generally this is the idea. So you have a network that is getting the input image, adding noise to it, and you then try to uh, discard this noise uh, out of the sample. So uh, these models are inspired by uh, thermodynamics. So they are usually uh, modeled as the ordinary differential equations. And they are very similar to the Markov chain. Uh, I'm not sure if you know what Markov chain is. So imagine you have different states uh, from 0 to 50. And in each state, you are adding noise. So the this, uh, like the second state, will be independent of the, for the first state. Because you only added noise into this one. So if you are able to discard the noise from the second state to the one, then you can come from the Z to the real image itself. So that's what they are thinking of. Uh, so I will not go into detail now. Maybe later we will uh, understand more. But what are the advantages of this model is you train only one network. Uh, your network is uh, trying to come from the X1 to X0, X2 to X1. So there is only one model trying to and that you are trying to train. And you gradually learn this uh, remove process of the noise. Uh, this is because the ordinary differential equations are not easy to, they are not actually analytically solvable, but you uh, try to solve them step by step. So like small steps, taking small steps to the right direction, and then in the end you will have a ideally uh, a, uh, a solution. And uh, so they are easy, easy to actually infer from a prompt. So if you have a network from here, then you can actually use a text prompt prompt or image prompt uh, so that you generate an image that you ask for. So that's actually the one of the good feature of the diffusion models. And uh, also I mentioned that the latent space is the same same size as the output, the input uh, input image. So you will soon uh, get out of the date. Uh, sorry, did I stop it? Okay. Uh, so you will soon get out of out of the date uh, for the diffusion models because every day there is a paper coming out, and uh, now I will go into some examples of the diffusion model, and afterwards uh, we will try to understand those foundations so that uh, you will get familiar with the researchers and what they are actually doing doing different from each other. Uh, so this is just some examples that I uh, get from the Twitter and account. And uh, they use this text prompt uh, to the DAL E model, the OpenAI's DAL E model. And you can see how the Homer Simpson's character is uh, figured in different scenarios. So, uh, like here, it's a pirate in the Pirate of Caribbean movie. Here is a different project. And you see, like, how the model itself is creating all these fantastic images, actually. I think they are kind of fun. and. Uh, if it was like five years ago, uh, we will be actually very surprised how a machine is able to do all of this. Uh, and these are some examples from the stable diffusion paper. So on the top, you see different prompts, uh, the text prompts. And uh, here you can see the, the different outputs of the, the model. So here, 
for example, the model actually illustrate a, a consciousness uh, neural network. So here we are actually seeing a squirrel eating a burger and uh, like a chair of that is looking like an octopus. That, that these are all actually kind of fun. Uh, and uh, here, like we also need to know what to prompt. So uh, there is actually a good site for this. So Lexica Art. Now I will go into the that search engine. So here there are billions of images that people generated with different prompts uh, using stable diffusion model. And uh, the better to learn what kind of prompt they have is better to look to the others. Uh, so let's actually check for a panda uh, related image. So let's see what prompt for this. So we have like a panda bears, multiple of them. So generally what they do is they first describe what they want to see in the image, and then they try to give some style. So it says very colorful, vibrant, cinematic. And then at the end, they generally give the artist name. So kind of they use their styles. So maybe we can use this kind of prompts uh, in our examples as well. Uh, like I encourage you actually to go this side. I will just push, like send this in the message. If you, like if you have time, just go there and play around what people are actually doing. Uh, so there is also a nice uh, GitHub repo. Uh, I think this was public. Maybe I can directly go to the first day I want. So this is the uh, repo that I have used for my collab as well. Uh, so they did a great job actually to explain some basics of the stable diffusion. Uh, and I will go into the collab actually. So you can see the link of the collab as well uh, that's sent. Uh, maybe while I'm actually talking about it, you can also go there. So this is the collab. I think I already connected here. So this is the collab notebook, but you need a hacking face uh, uh, token. If you have like a user there, you can just log in and run the code together. But I will not run it because they are, they are like in terms of size, they are really big, so it will take time. So uh, this is prepared by the these folks, and they are from the Hugging Face. They actually built the Fuser uh, library, so it's a great library that you can use for different uh, diffusion models people are publishing. So uh, here they basically do some imports, and uh, for example, there is a model. This model is actually the original model. Model they uh, uh, the stable diffusion uh, guys shared. So if you go to hugging face and do like a search here, you will see that uh, model. And this is kind of a repo. And uh, these are the files that it will download. They just wanna like, you will understand all of this, I think hopefully at the end of the talk. So we have like a feature extractor, we have a scheduler, we have a unit, we have also variational autoencoder. These are all actually used in the uh, stable diffusion uh, model. So here I basically use their library and just call this and everything will be downloaded automatically. And uh, stable diffusion is not only one model, they are using multiple of those. So it's kind of a pipeline. That's why they named this pipeline. So uh, let's go what we have. So this is already downloaded in the cache. So I have a prompt here. Uh, so it says uh, like a panda mad scientist mixing sparkling chemicals and it should be digital art. And uh, you can see what my output is looking like. So you can see there are also 51 steps took here. So this is the, the noise removal process that I was talking about. So you don't remove at the one step, try to take minim, um, like a minimum steps, but into the right direction so that you find the uh, original, the right image that you are uh, hoping for. So if you have different seats, you will have different images just if you, like uh, if you go to the notebook and try to do some uh, tests with your uh, preferences, if you change your seed, the random seed, then you will have a different image came out. So here we see like a, a panda, a really sweet panda thing on the space. Uh, and then we can change the number of inference step. Uh, as I mentioned at the end of talk, you will understand all of these uh, parameters. So if I, don't use 50 steps, but the 16 steps, you can see my model is not yet good enough. So there are still a lot of noise that needs to be removed. 
removed. So imagine this is the 16th step and this is the 51th step. And we need to remove all the noise around here and generate the image, the original image that we are asking for. And if we increase the inference step to 30, uh, 32, it's getting a little bit better, but you see there are some also uh, artifacts around there. These are all noise. Uh, so uh, this is how the actual model need to, uh, needs to work. And uh, there is also a concept called classifier free guidance. Uh, this is just imagine you have a, like a method to say how much you, how much the model should actually uh, represent my text prompt. And uh, this is just a number starting from one to like maybe infinity, but the uh, default is 7.5. Uh, I think in the library, that was it. But we are just running with several different of them and trying to understand how the classifier free uh, guidance scale is actually changing our output. So I ran for four different guidance scales. And uh, in the first row, you see for, for each of the guidance scale, I'm creating and like, generating four images. So in the first one, uh, you see they are not really looking like pandas, uh, sorry, panda images. Uh, so it is uh, not actually using my prompt uh, to generate image. Uh, as I increase the guidance scale, they are looking more like uh, panda. And uh, you see when I have like a guidance scale of seven, it is much more looking like this. And if I have like 14, it's just generating panda. So there is a sweet spot uh, for that guidance scale. And there you can also like have ne negative prompts. So imagine you have a, like this prompt, Panda in style of the Van Gogh, and you wanna remove the uh, green color in this image. So you can actually provide those negative prompt. And uh, let's say we have this uh, same uh, seed and uh, using the grid, uh, green, and then you're basically getting rid of all the greens and the model is trying to generate a mod uh, image without green color. So uh, these are all actually nice features that you can use and play around. You don't need to like do a text prompt. You can also use an image prompt. Uh, what the image prompt is doing is they are not starting from the noise itself. They are starting from the image that you provided as reference and trying to generate an image uh, based on the image that you provide uh, as prompt. So here uh, we downloaded a sketch uh, from internet, you see we have like a kind of uh, animal figure here and there are maybe like a moon figure. And then we will try to create images out of this one. So it's similar to this one. Imagine we have like a, a draw from our kids and we want to make them more realistic. This is like a, a very easy to do with this library and you can play around with this. So you see when I generated three different of those with this parameter and you can see I have a wolf with this prompt as well. So I have an image and text prompt. They are both uh, uh, input to the model and you will generate this kind of images that look like this, like more realistic ones. And you can also uh, like generate the same one in the Van Gogh style. So that's like, uh, there are actually many things to do here, but just go there and uh, uh, test it, play around after maybe talk. So the, the rest of the, uh, collab is like introducing you how to fine tune a model, uh, how to use different text uh, prompts so that you are able to generate uh, different kind of like styles. So here, what they do is actually they're using a, a different uh, token. So they use a token that is not never in the uh, in the text encoder, and whenever this token is used, they provide some uh, stylish images and whenever you have this token in your prompt then this fine-tuned model will generate those like try to get similar uh, style in the output uh, this is also like a similar way of doing that uh, just go there and i will not go into detail for this uh, so what are what is stable division so we know what we can do at least uh, with this call up notebook there are, uh, so what we need to about know the stable diffusion so that we can actually contribute uh, or even understand what's going on here. So there are three components uh, of the stable diffusion, uh, a variation autoencoder, a UNET. UNET is kind of image to image uh, network that is mostly used in the medical imaging. And you also need a text encoder to understand the problems. So 
Now I will go into the slides and continue from there. So uh, whenever you go to a blog, you will see lots of mathematical formulas and uh, there are many different ways to actually introduce what's happening in the stable diffusion. Uh, but I will take the other way around and try to uh, make it more easy to understand. So imagine we have an image uh, of a digit and it is four. Then we have a digit classifier, which says if this is a digit or not, like uh, not the, the digit itself, but the, if it's a digit or not, it's a binary classification. And then whenever we send this uh, to our classifier, it will give a probability value of being digit. Uh, for this one, it is around one. So it is almost a, a perfect image of digit. So imagine we added some noise on this gradually. And uh, this image is now looking less like a digit and our classifier will probably give a lower probability value for this and then we added a little bit more now it's even less so let's say 0 0.3 and at the end it's kind of all pure noise here we don't even see the, any digit in this image and the probability is pretty low so generally this classifier will be called as score function and what diffusion model is itself is doing uh, we are trying to always remember we are trying to go from latent space to the uh, uh, image that we are we want to generate so this is a pure noise and generally the latent space is a pure noise that you generated with some dimensions and uh, we want to remove the noise gradually from this image to this and then from this to this and at the end uh, we will have the uh, image that is generated and every time we remove a noise, we expect our classifier to have a probability value increased. And we will always keep track of this probability value and change different pixels. If we increase or decrease the noise, uh, the pixel value there, if it's a noise or not, not, then we will have the change in the classifier and then continue this process until we have a, a nice image that we want at, at the end. So, this is actually introducing that process. So we start with the pure noise, then we uh, go over all the pixel and de determine this. these are the noises that we can remove. And then we have a higher probability value. And then we added a little bit more of the noise and remove those. And then we had this and had this, and you can see how the image itself is looking after rem removal of the noise. And at the end, we expect it to have a high resolution a digit image. So this is the general idea. And if you have any questions here, please go on. And now I will go into more into the detail of the network. All right, I think everything is clear here. So how we can remove this the noise? And this is done by UNET. Uh, don't worry about the, how the architecture of the UNET works. Just imagine it's a neural network. You have the input and output, input and output have the same dimension size. And uh, what you wanna determine is having like from this image to determine the noise values. These are the noises. If our model says these are the noises, then we can basically extract those noises from the uh, latent and then uh, get the final value that we have. But this will not be in one step, but you will have like a, a multiple steps of the noise removal using unit. And uh, imagine we have like a, this image uh, of size like 28, 28, and output will be also 28 to 28. For each of the pixel, we will uh, say, okay, decrease this pixel, increase this pixel, uh, pixel and uh, that will be uh, our output of the unit. But uh, the problem is when you have low dimension of the images, it's, uh, it will be all fine. But uh, sometimes we want to generate like a higher resolution images and uh, the resources that you have, maybe you don't have like a, a 800 to uh, GPU train uh, such a network. And uh, then we use actually image compression uh, method, uh, which is basically a variation of encoder. Uh, so what you do here, you have a uh, high resolution image, then you uh, encode it using a, pre-trained variation of the end-to-end encoder. And you will have a latent that is describing all the information that you have in this image. 
but in a smaller size. So how maybe you will ask how this is possible? Uh, imagine you have the JPEG format. You have maybe like a PNG format. All of those formats are actually image compression algorithms because for example, for this image, we have a lot of zeros here. So there is no color here. We can have a better way of actually uh, describing this image uh, and uh, then recreate this image using an algorithm. And JPEG is kind of like a, a compression algorithm. And there are also really, uh, really good uh, pre-trained models for images using variational autoencoders. And this is actually what is used in the stable diffusion model. And uh, this will be much smaller in the size, and this will help us actually to uh, to train our models uh, with less resources. So when we came here, so in the previous one, the input will not be the image itself. We will have a, like a variational autoencoder here. So we will have a lower dimension of the representation of the images. And then output will also be the uh, lower dimension of the noises. And then we will extract those noises from the latents and then recreate our image uh, here uh, as using variational time coder uh, part. So this will be like more processing is needed in training and uh, inference, but it will help us to actually train such models without any trouble. So we did the image compression and now we are able to actually train such a models, but how we can integrate a text prompt. So imagine we have the, we wanna just generate some digits and we have 10 digits and if you have 10 digits, then you can just provide the one hot encode of all of those uh, digits together with the image itself to the uh, unit. And your output, like your model will learn, okay, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to generate a, a number four. But if this is only a text, so I change this number four to uh, generate me a beautiful panda, like uh, playing chess. So. You can you can never actually uh, one hot encode all the possible uh, sentences. So the way that they did it actually they used a method called uh, clip contrastive language image pre-training. So what it does? Imagine you have the digit four, and I have here a different sentence. So it says stylish number four. So uh, I want to understand this text and uh, try to try to. Uh, uh, encode it in a such a way that my model will understand I'm trying to generate uh, a stylish number four. So what they do, they use a text encoder and image encoder. Uh, don't worry about what uh, encoder they are using. Just, uh, for example, this can be a BERT, this can be a, a VGG16. You just encode those, but the dimension of the uh, encoding, uh, the embedding should be the same. And what you do is, uh, like for example here, the, we have like a corgi playing a flame throwing trumpet. And uh, we have an image encoder here. This is the image encoding. And we have also the text encoding here. So what we're trying to do is we want to actually make this both of both encoding similar to each other. So if you provide this image to the image encoder, you will get an embedding. And if you provide the same text to a text encoder, you should get very similar embedding with this image encoding box. So Imagine you just actually write anything and your model will understand what kind of image that, that it should look like. And what they do is, for example, I have four, number four here, uh, and I have the, like, these are the text embeddings, these are the image embeddings, and these both should be similar to each other. And I have here the, the, the uh, image five embedding and tag this text embedding. So these should be far from each other, Diagonal ones should be closer to each other. So they create a contrastive loss, which is basically just summing up this and negating all the rest so that you uh, make the similar sentences and the images to close to each other and the other ones to away from each other. And uh, this is actually first, I think, used in the DALI. And uh, that was actually the revolution that they did. Uh, but they never actually uh, shared their model, open source it. But they use the same uh, idea in also in the stable, stable diffusion. And this is how they do. So when I came back to here, so I will have a number four, like here you will have a texting uh, prompt and you will also have a text encoder here. So that encoder will actually 
generate the encoding and you will provide that together with your uh, latent image to the unit so that your model will understand okay what kind of image i'm trying to generate so this is the, actually the three main components that we mentioned so we have we need an autoencoder uh, they use variation autoencoder so we need an image to image network for stable diffusion and they selected unit and we also need a clip text encoder so on the right you see actually an image from the blog post from hugging face so they actually describe everything that we are talking about so we have a user import uh, user prompt here so an astronaut riding a horse and they have like a pre-trained clip uh, based text encoder they generate an embedding of this size this is uh, kind of giving all the information regarding an image that you want to uh, have and you also start from a gaussian noise so you have this noise input as an input to the unit together with this text embeddings and you will have an output of the same size as the, your noise and uh, your, your noise is basically latent uh, got from the variation of time encoder and then you repeat this procedure n times and there is also a maybe you might see actually this term of scheduler the noise scheduler uh, I, I will not go into detail of this but it is kind of the way that how much noise sh you should remove uh, and add during the training it's kind of like your uh, strategy of the noise adding so you repeat this for n times so every time you are trying to remove noises and uh, at the end you, ideally you should have like a nice image a latent and if you just use the various autoencoders decoder part take the inference of it you will have a, a high resolution image of like uh, 512 512 and uh, this is the general idea of the stable diffusion uh i think we are like uh, faster than i expected so if you have any questions please go on uh this was basically it i have one yes please go on. you have started your talk with showing drawbacks of uh, variational autoencoder um uh, guns and flow based model and then you told that to overcome these drawbacks, we need to use at the end of yes. your talk, your stable diffusion model again is using variation of autoencoder, also a variation of autoencoder. Doesn't it uh, inherit all drawbacks uh, you mentioned in your um, first slide? Mm, not not really so like i'm not uh, really training a variational autoencoder like autoencoder is good for compression images but it's not good for taking a prompt and generating a like photorealistic image of that prompt so that is the drawback of the variational autoencoder uh, if you have a, like a pre-trained variational autoencoder and use as the compression so it's just a pre-training i'm not really training that model it is uh, trained already on billions of the images so it is good for compression and to get high resolution images in my stable diffusion architecture, but it is not good to get a prompt and retrain that model for uh, generating a realistic images, for example, for uh, the prompt that we are using in the collab. So we have a, like a panda doing some uh, scientific stuff. Variational autoencoder needs actually that kind of data to be trained so that it can generate that. So it is not really uh, generating from your prompt, but it is learning how to express an image. Uh, so that's why we use just variation autoencoder as the compression uh, algorithm. So we are not really training that. Also for the uh, unit part, uh, the, actually the only thing that you are training is the unit. Uh, and we, we are only training one model, so it is stable diffusion is much stable than the, the other models that I'm mentioning at the beginning. But unit is a uh, variation of autoencoder, I mean. It's, uh, auto yes, I agree. Uh, layers. The, I agree, but it the also still, has, uh, it is la latent space. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I mean, you should have latent space, but uh, yeah, I mean, you should have latent space in such uh, models. So, and you should actually able to have a network that is going from the image to image. So, I mean, there is still, of course, drawbacks of the unit is coming together with uh, stable diffusion, but 
the whole architecture is actually stable diffusion, not that model, not just that model. So I am now able to generate photorealistic images using this pipeline. So with UNET, you will not be able to do that. You will only have an image and try to generate the same size of the image uh, and try to encode that in a uh, latent space. But here, my latent space is different. And I'm always actually updating my latent space, not the, not just the weights. So imagine I, let me just go here. Uh, where was that? Uh, Yeah, this one is okay. So, uh, and this one is okay. So, you, you see, like I'm actually updating every time my output. So I'm taking the extraction here, the subtraction here. So I'm while I'm learning this unit, learning the weights, I'm also updating the the input, like the output of the uh, my model, and it will be the next input of uh, the next iteration. So I'm also updating this. Uh, vector space so it's not just actually learning the uh, the latent space that you need it's actually coming from a latent space and updating that latent space so that you at the end achieve your results uh, that is actually the nice thing about uh, stable diffusion and you can go from any directory from that direct uh, from that starting point depending on your prompt and it is much easier to actually train against uh, all the other most models that i was mentioning Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's not the, of course, perfect, but it is coming with the drawbacks of the models that it is using. But the whole pipeline should be considered as the architecture, not just the variation of time coded part. Okay, thank you. And, um, there is a question in the chat by Vish. Maybe you can read it. Yeah, that was quite simple to understand. My question is, since one of the key components of the diffusion model is the image-to-image -image network, uh, what gap do you see in the research? Uh, as in, can this model be improved further? Uh, also, can we conduct experiments with the modalities such that text and maybe by changing this net, maybe by changing this network? Uh, like, maybe I can first start with the, what gap do you see in the research? So. Uh, like in terms of gap, they actually uh, constructed this problem as uh, ordinary differential equations. But if we had like time to go into more detail of this as mathematical formula, we also have like a C here. So it's like more looking like a, a, a learning process. Like our, we can actually model this uh, as if this is uh, our loss and we are trying to gradually go into the gradient direction directory. So we can even use like different kind of uh, optimizer that we have. So uh, this one, like always, like there are some stuff that I didn't mention, but this unit is generally taking also the amount of noise that has been added at that stage. So this is uh, quite important uh, for the ordinary differential equation. But if we assume that this model is able to understand the noise amount, then we can actually reformulate this as a, a classical learning process of the, for example, the uh, Nifton's methods. You have the gradient and you gradually uh, go into the directory. So this can be actually a one of the way of doing it. And the other one is, uh, just give me a second, sorry. Uh, sorry guys, there was an interruption. Uh, so this can be one way and also for each of the components that I was mentioning, of course, we can actually have a better model there that might work. Uh, that's a really nice way of looking at it. So also there are different ways of actually doing it. Uh, we can also have like, there's. A, I think there was a nice research done uh, by adding two UNET networks. So for example, we were going 50 steps, uh, but if we have like a UNET network trying to predict each of those steps like by skipping those. So when I have the zero step input and try to predict the fifth step uh, output, uh, while I'm also training both of the unit networks, maybe I can actually decrease this inference time. So 
there were like an example of this. So we can actually play around all these components so that can come up with a faster and maybe like more uh, realistic research. Uh, like, I mean, there is every day a paper uh, for this, and I think it's really hard to keep up with all the research that has been happening, but uh, there are quite, uh, I think there should be quite actually gaps that we can have here. We can change the loss. For example, this unit is trained on the mean square error between the output and the input. Uh, we can maybe like have a uh, different uh, way of doing this because what we want is finding the noise values, not finding like uh, uh, the mean square error between the both, both of those. So this might be like maybe a binary classifier for each of the pixels. So I mean, uh, these are just uh, coming uh, right now, but uh, for each of the component, I think we can think on it and try to find a uh, better approach. And uh, what was the other questions? Uh, it says, can you conduct experiments with modalities such as text and um, maybe changing this network? Uh, definitely, we can have like a different uh, prompt. As long as you are able to represent a prompt as a vector, uh, you can use anything. Maybe you can have like a video as a prompt. You can have a, a speech as a prompt. Uh, as long as you are able to actually train such a model that you have uh, a clip-like embedding, then you can use this uh, into the your architecture here and then generate uh, not just images, maybe you can generate even speeches. So that's also uh, another thing that can be applied here. Uh, so I hope this was clear for you. Yes, it was. Thank you. Thank you very much. So for the other question from Menon. Uh, is there any way to identify whether an image is generated or actually created by human? Uh, I think there are some research actually going around that, but that will be kind of a different thing uh, for today's talk. Uh, but there should be for sure some uh, model artifact that you can actually capture from the output of the images. Uh, but uh, that's kind of a different research topic that has been done actually for quite a while, uh, especially after style gun was uh, introduced. And, and I'm sure there are some models that are able to understand if an image generated by the style gun or not. So for this, maybe there, are, there will be several like different uh, models that can be trained. So uh, which pretend bias are used? Uh, I'm not really sure about that. Maybe here we would have, uh, think, but I don't know the name, but I, Remember, maybe in the collab notebook also there was uh, one. Uh, so there was a pre-trained notebook from the Hugging Face uh, trained on the image net data, like billions of the images. But I don't know exactly what kind of, and what was the name of the pre-trained bias. But I encourage you to check the collab. I think there was a uh, one there. Uh, also the GitHub repo. Uh, so uh, for the question from Pico, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is the same unit model fine-tuned or each step of the adding and removing the noise. Yes, it is fine-tuned, but uh, if you have already, I mean, if you don't have a specific uh, idea to generate uh, stable diffusion uh, images, then you can use a pre-trained model for sure in a different scenario with different encoders. And, but uh, it is also, this is actually the only part that you are training. So uh, second question is the, the, in the slide showing the removal of the noise, why the probabilities increase when the image becomes less noisy, as in uh, noise would be more common. Uh, no, that probability was the probability of being a digit. So I was going the other way around. So if I have a digit classifier saying if this image looks like a digit or not, uh, that probability will increase since I removed the noises, but in this unit, I think it's a good question. So in this unit architecture, I'm doing the other way around. I'm not actually trying to uh, determine if this image is looking like a digit or not. I'm just trying to determine which pixels should be increased or decreased. And I'm trying to just remove the noise part. Uh, so it is this probability value is coming from the digit classifier. Uh, but for unit, the thing that you're saying is right. So it, 
will be doing the other way around. I'm just trying to detect the noises uh, in the unit and the stable diffusion does that. Uh, okay, so, makes sense. Uh, Thanks. Uh, thank you, Pico. Uh, so isn't the VA pre-trained on, I, I'm not really sure. I think I think that's right, actually. Lie on 5B. Uh, I think that was right, but I don't remember exactly which one was used. Also, like for Biopart, just think if uh, it's a compression algorithm. So I have one more question. Um, so UNET is really doing the the noising part, right? Uh, exactly. And lion and, and the VAE portrayed in lion, like the I, I think the I wonder if this is fair to say that. Lion is not the the V is not necessarily just a compression algorithm because Lion five B is not a random data set of images, right? It's specifically, I think, selected for their aesthetic um, uh, qualities. So it's supposed to be um, it, it's supposed to be a data set of um, images that are very appealing to humans, and, and and I think they've been trying to build up this this, this massive database, and then um, the fact that you're squeezing it through a pipe. Uh, sorry, out of, uh, you know, for the uh, uh, variational uh, auto -deco uh, auto encoder decoder that has been pre-trained to produce pretty things. That's the, that's the thing that gives uh, stable diffusion its, um, you know, uh, artistic ability. Uh, I think that's the, the, if I understood, if I understood your talk correctly, that the, this, this training set is really quite an important component of the fact that, uh, that contributes to the fact that you can produce something aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing to humans because in the first place, the VAE, is condition is conditioned to create a space of aesthetically aesthetically pleasing things. Yes and no. Uh, so I definitely agree with the aesthetics part and the variational auto encoder is trained on like a uh, stylish data, and then it will generate those images much better than the, any other uh, variant of it. Uh, but uh, like uh, these models are still able to actually generate photorealistic images as well. So uh, it also like uh, it always depends on the like the quality of your images or style of your images are dependent on the variation of the encoder part because that is actually the at the end generating the input uh, the image that you are asking for. But these models are also capable of to generate uh, real, uh, photorealistic ones. And uh, for example, if you want to actually uh, have I don't know, like a very different style of uh, images to generate, you better to actually change your variation of time encoder if that is not trained on such a data. That, uh, I definitely agree on that. Uh, but even like the, there were some examples that I was actually playing around. Uh, like they, the variation of time encoder was really good at actually generating original, uh, the generating re realistic images, it was still able to actually uh, fine tune uh, like fine tune your unit so that we can generate some uh, stylish images as well during your uh, fine tuning process. So it is always critical to select which kind of pre-trained model you will use depending on the output that you ask. Uh, but uh, there is still a sweet point uh, that you should keep track and most of those models are capable of actually generate some realistic images as well. And one more question we may. Um, so where does the connection uh, with a specific styles uh, of a specific artist get established? So, I, you know, I know that we're adding this, this clip like prompt, uh, clip encoded prompt, um, uh, you know, to the division process, but where in the training uh, does the model learn that, for instance, these are the, uh, you know, this is the Van Gogh style? All right. Uh, first of all, your text encoder should know that. So if your text, like in the clip process, uh, if your text encoder is uh, good enough to actually understand, I am mentioning about Van Gogh and my image should look like, at least in the embeddings part, should be similar to the Van Gogh's images embedding. So that's actually the important part so that your text prompt is understood by your unit. So you need to train a clip uh, text net encoder uh, so that you actually understand that from text. Uh, also, your variation auto encoder should be able to actually generate such images. So probably there will be some data that is trained if you are mentioning about Van Gogh. But if there is an artist that is never heard uh, from, like never uh, used in the clip 
text encoder training, then you will actually don't understand the style of that artist from text itself. So that is actually the critical part that you need to focus. So it should be the clip text encoder training. So the embedding produced by clip, um, the, it, which is kind of like the initial conditions for the um, let's call you know the re reverse diffusion. Um, that that embedding when when clip uh, finishes the embedding into the, the vector space, those vectors have to somehow correspond to vectors that the um, VAE will understand to be something Van Gogh like. Is, 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 is no, that not VA. Not VA. So when you are training a, so let me go to this figure. So when you are training a text encoder, uh, it's actually fairly easy to gather data, gather training data. Like from internet, you have the images and the caption for that. So using that caption and those images, you will train two uh, two networks at the same time. So you have an image encoder, you have a text encoder. The image encoder is showing us. Uh, actually, this image encoder should, can be also used as pre-training because what it does is actually uh, just configuring, like in a way that you have the representation of the image in the vector space. So what I'm uh, trying to most focus on is text encoder part. So I have this prompt and my text encoder should create an embedding similar to this image encoder so that uh, I can train this text encoder. For example, let's say I have Van Gogh images and I have uh, expression like the caption of those images so my text encoder will understand okay Van Gogh token is important for this kind of images and uh, when I have like a uh, Salvador Dali then I have a different embedding uh, generated uh, for Salvador Dali so that is a different token and my text encoder will understand this whenever I have trained such a model then my unit is actually learning from that those embeddings itself. so I froze this so in the training process, I froze this text encoder, and I use only the embeddings that I extracted using a prompt. And then my unit is actually learning from those embeddings that, okay, my image, like whenever I remove the noise, uh, in the training, imagine you are actually adding the noise and then trying to remove those. You already know which are the noise, which are the not. So your unit gradually learn, okay, this is the image, the final image that I am going when this embeddings comes to me. And, uh, all of this is actually happening between the clip encoding and also the unit. But one notice that the first actually question that you ask, the variational autoencoder should be able to be capable of actually generate those kind of images at the end. Mm -hmm. So if it's not able so, to because I understand that in the clip, you know, you control the above the encoder and the decoder, right? And and here you're just using the encoder of the clip, but the decoder is a completely different thing trained on a different uh, on a potentially different data set. Is, is that correct? Uh, those are different. So this encoder is encoding from the prompt text input that you have, but uh, this decoder is actually decoding from the later. So here in the data set, uh, I'm actually using this the same variation encoder to come with this latent. So actually this is generating the image from those latent space, but uh, this encoder is just encoding the text input. So this is decoding the image. So they are actually different. All right, thanks. You're welcome. So I have another question from Joseph. Uh, there is any interoperability work on the diffusion model? Uh, is such a way we can understand how the model works during the generation? Uh, that's a good question. I don't really know the answer for it. But maybe like a sharp like analysis can work on this. So you might, like you have these latents. So uh, from those latents, uh, I think in DALI 2, they use actually PCA to decrease their uh, dimensions. So you can do such an analysis on the latents and try to see which kind of the region is uh, clustered for which kind of the images that you are generating. So this can be done. I think there were quite research for style guide in such cases. So you may remember there was some apps that you are actually making you old, making you girl, making you like with glass. So those are all happening actually in the analyzing these latents. And I think the same can be done also for the stable diffusion. So you, which direction actually makes you old, which direction change your uh, sex. So uh, also analyze like when you predict this in output. So where was the actual the latent 
uh, vector that you use for this one. So they all actually are open to writing uh, research. I didn't see any, but maybe there are some I missed. So another one from Joseph. Thanks, Tom. Uh, you're welcome. I was saying thanks, and I have I was typing another question. Yeah. I saw that. So you said that I noticed that the generation is quite slow. Uh, are the some work on the inference optimization? Uh, if yes, is it possible to perform do it in real time, or at least do it is takes to generate an image? So how long it takes to generate an image? Uh, so I actually mentioned one approach. So maybe I go into the uh, notebook, show it there. Let's just say close. So what this? Okay, let's just uh, focus on this image. I think there was actually a nice image of this, but uh, how can I find that? Let's go into the slide, that will be easier. So uh, imagine we are trying to go from this part to latent, the pure noise. Uh, sorry, from this part to the real image. So this is pure noise, and I'm removing noise gradually. There is a way to do a faster uh, inference. So here I am taking one, two, three, four, five steps. And imagine I am training another network here. Uh, it's also a unit, let's say. And I am trying to predict from this, like how can I from go from this to this, and then from this to this, and then this. So skipping uh, everyone. So this unit will actually learn from the output of the, your iterations, and it will actually decrease your inference time uh, by two. So that was the one research that I read. So it was actually like if you have, I think it was increasing the inference uh, by like four times faster, but there was maybe that some other research is going on, but that was actually the one that I was also mentioning. So you, there is also a way to increase your inference. And of course, if you have a better GPU, better machine, uh, it will do real time, kind of real time. But uh, the one that I was doing in the call up, uh, I think it was taking around 30 seconds for only one image generation. Uh, and with 50 steps. Uh, so if you use that unit model and with a faster GPU, you might uh, get such a way. And there are also some people actually doing some video uh, outputs from the stable diffusion outputs. So you not generate only one, uh, one image, you generate a stably changed video of that. Uh, I think it was called Deformer, uh, yeah, it, I think it was Deformer Stable, something like that. Uh, so they were creating a video of the stable diffusion output. Uh, okay, guys, I think we are running a bit late, and some of us have other have another call. So maybe we can if there is just last question, or we can. Um, maybe finish so thank you Ahmed it was really interesting and also fruitful full of the interesting things and I also enjoy um, these many questions and um, I think that if you want to, to know more maybe you can contact uh, Ahmed if you're curious about some some sure, topics sure, sure. he discussed and stop them. That's all from uh, from my side. Uh, thank you. Thank you again. And see you yeah. next time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time. I think we are out of the time <laughs> quite. And I will share my slides uh, to Lucia. Thank you, Omar. Yeah. Then you will be able to uh, get that. And I will wait for the YouTube link. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, much guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.